I don't know why he had to mention coffee. <laughs> no, so <laughs> Amen. No, we we sure do appreciate that potluck there. Now, if, now the trick is just to stay away. And you guys keep in mind, I can see every eyeball in here from up here. <laughs> now that's uh. We're just really thankful to be up here and be able to have fellowship with you guys. And let's read our Bibles and open them up to 1 Corinthians. Chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll be looking mainly at verse 18. But I'd like to begin by reading verses 18 through 25. So 1 Corinthians 1, starting at verse 18. <clears throat> For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And that's a very interesting text. The reason that I chose this text is because of an experience that I've had recently and that I've had before. And it wouldn't be the first time that somebody thought that some person that's standing on a book written by men is a fool where you be made felt terrible because you believe some book blindly. And I don't know if you guys have experienced that, where people think you're foolish because you trust in the Bible. And if you've talked to anyone at length about anything spiritual, you probably have realized that that's the truth. And so this text really instantly came into my mind. As, as I'll read it again. It says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Now there's there's... A ton in that verse. It's really an action-packed verse. So I hope you have your seatbelts on for this afternoon here. And after the hot wings, I'm ready to, <laughs> to go here. So um, we see this phrase, preaching of the cross. Now that word preaching on that verse could mean the word of, the word of the cross or the message of. So that's, what, that's where it's the word of the cross, the message of the cross. It says the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. He's not talking about the preaching of the cross itself. He's talking about the preaching of the, the, what the cross means, not the preaching itself, but what, what the preaching is about, the cross being the foolishness. Does that make sense? This is basically the preaching of the cross, the word of the cross, what the cross itself teaches. It sums up Paul's concept of the gospel of our Lord. The word of the cross brings some important concepts, really important concepts here. There's God communing with men through the cross, and there's very much to learn as we go through the scriptures here today. And let's uh, have a word of prayer so we can get our hearts prepped up so we can learn out of God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you we have your word. We thank you that you are so able to teach us through it and God, I just pray for myself here this afternoon that, that nothing be added, no words used that don't need to be, but the God that I can say everything that you have me say. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So in, verse, in that verse, we see the, the revelation of God to man. Right, God, if a God created man, he must communicate with man, with his creation. He's got to do it. Right. And so he, he's, he does it by his word. Amen. And that's what we see here in verse 18. And then the, the, so part of that revelation of God to man is the revelation of the power of God. And we did talk about the power of God at length this morning. 
And, but it's something that we must be familiar with and we must be aware of. And so let's look at verse 24. It says, But we preach Christ crucified, and to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. You see that? So it uses it in 18. To which are saved is the power of God in verse 24, Christ, the power of God. And I don't know about you, but I think that God wants us to realize that Christ and the preaching of the cross is the power of God. Amen. Amen. And one of God's main attributes, like we talked about this morning, is God's power. Amen. And without that power, we're helpless, right? If God can't have any power, if God can't raise Jesus from the dead, then we haven't any hope and we haven't a Savior. And we have much power in God. Now, God... His power, his omnipotence is something that we can't quite grasp as humans. Now, we have a hard time measuring power, and how I know that is is we still measure it in horses, right? <laughs> We're measuring power in horses still, and meanwhile, we have God who is omnipotent and has all power in all the world. I like as a family, one of our favorite things to do is sit on the front porch during a thunderstorm. I don't know if you've ever done that, but we're like protected from the elements. But it is downpouring, and there's lightning, and there's thunder, and it's about shatter. You know, it shakes the whole place. That's God's power. Yes. We're on the 4th of July. We're headed back, and you can see their little fireworks going up. And meanwhile, in the background, as we're going down the interstate, is just this lightning coming. In. And I'm like, that's the power of God right there. Yes. Now, a man can make one good-looking firework, as we were talking about earlier. But when you talk about... <laughs> A thunderstorm. Now that's God's power. And try to measure that in horses. You can't. You can't measure it. And so it's just something we have to accept that we can't fully understand. Job 26, 14 says, Though these are the parts of his ways, but how little a portion is heard of him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? Even Job couldn't understand it. But he saw it. We can experience it can't fully understand it and you see that term those that perish who is he talking about there you remember we were talking about in the book of romans that all have sinned and come short of the glory of god that uh the wages of sin is death those are the ones that perish because we're in our sin so we die what is death what is perishing it's separation and separation from what from god That's what perishing is. So those that are separated from God, it's foolishness. This preaching of the word is, uh, like again, foolishness. And like I was talking about before, we've all experienced that. When you start talking about the Christ and, and him crucified and him being our salvation, then you're a fool to those that perish. They don't want anything to do with that. But what we need for us is God to reveal to us the gospel, right? And and when that happens, that's when we, the foolishness of those other, the world, when when we get saved and God illumines his truth to us, that's when it becomes the very thing that you thought was foolish now becomes the very power of God. Isn't that a beautiful thing? I don't know how that is. It's a two-sided thing. And that's why we're here today, right? is because of the power of God in the cross and what it took on the cross. That Jesus came into this world, he left heaven, and he took on the form of a body. And he lived a life in our place. He lived a life that we were intended to live, a life without sin. And then he went on to live perfectly and then to die on a cross and to die the death that we deserve in our place. And that's the story, that's the gospel, that's in which we're saved by that by our substitutionary atonement on the cross. And this power is very effectual. It has a great effect on our life. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Paul says. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so when you're reading that, when Paul says that, when you read that in Romans 1, and it says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, we go out there and we stand up to those people who think it's foolishness. Let them call you a fool. Don't be offended at them. Because the reality is they're the fool because they're sitting there rejecting a holy God. They're offending, they're living in their sin. They're running their way right to hell. 
and they're going to call you a fool. Let them call you that. Don't let that discourage you. It didn't discourage Paul. Let's with Paul say that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because it's the power of God. And that power of God unto salvation is within us. The very power that raised Jesus from the dead is within us. We have to remember that we're not the ones to be ashamed. And the revelation of the wisdom of God. So we have the power of God in verse 18, and we are in verse uh, yeah, 18. The power, no, verse 24, it says the power of God and the wisdom of God. So we have the power of God and the wisdom of God. So he, he, he's trying to uh, communicate to us the wisdom of God. But when you think of the wisdom of God, that's another thing that's kind of like the power of God. How could we ever grasp the, the wisdom of God? I think that's a, a challenging thing to do is uh, grasp that. Because God's never, have you realized that God's never learned anything? I've heard one man say, has it ever occurred to you that nothing occurred to God? Right? That can't be in our minds. We can't figure that out. But when it's a lot of time in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, it talks about wisdom. It's talking about being skillful. And that's more on our level. We can't have the omniscience. We can't have the all-knowing part of God. But when we have the attribute we can get, and the wisdom of God is like a, as being very skillful. And I heard it put this way, and this can make the most sense to me, as if you're ever, I don't know if you guys have a lot of this in Gillette, maybe in Moorcroft, but if you're in a traffic jam somewhere, <laughs> but anyway, if you're in a traffic jam, you don't really have a clue on what is going on. Why are we stopped? Have you ever been in that? And you say, why are we stopped? What's going on? You're back of a semi and all you can see is the truck and you're like, what is going on up there, right? And so we think as humans that wisdom is to be able to be in the traffic helicopter they can say, yeah, we got a wreck down here on exit 49 and da-da-da-da-da. And that's the wisdom of our life, is that if we can get that overhead view of our life and to understand all of it, that's how we gain wisdom. That's not how we gain wisdom. How we gain wisdom is to be able to skillfully navigate through the traffic jam. So the, the view that comes out and he can see all things, that's God. What we have is a, is a view from the dashboard. Right? And so... The wisdom that we get from following God is how we can skillfully navigate through that traffic jam to get around it or whatever the case may be. Right. Is if we could communicate or we could hear on the radio, okay, it's going to fit you to take this exit or don't go down that road. And we can listen to those words and we can follow and we can safely get through it and switch lanes without running into anybody. That's our wisdom. And so on a spiritual level, we're never going to fully understand every aspect of our life, but what we can do is figure out where God has us when we're in His will, and we can safely navigate through. And so that's the difference of the, the wisdom of God and our wisdom, is navigating through circumstances with God. And we talked a little bit about Job 28. He says, where can wisdom be found? And in 28, it says, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. So our wisdom is to skillfully navigate with that in mind in the fear of the Lord. So with wisdom that we get in verse 24 here comes action, right? When we get that wisdom, we're changed. And God uh, chooses to give us and to show us his wisdom. And through our obedience, he makes us more like his son. So God shows us his wisdom, and then we can, in that, get the wisdom of our own, and then if we're obedient to what he has for us, he can change us into the image of his own son. Amen? Amen? Now, isn't that somewhere where we all want to go? Is to be changed into the image of Jesus Christ. And through the power of the Spirit, and through the knowledge of this book, and the wisdom that we can find in it, we have the difference, if we're being a Spirit-led believer, navigating through this life, we have the difference through obedience, the difference between a nominal Christian and then a spirit-filled Christian with the power of God. And what this church needs, what the church as a whole needs, what God needs is not more nominal Christianity. We need to be following God by the Spirit, and we need to be doing the things that He says. And so... Um, 
in verse 18, we also see a proclamation of God to man. So we have the, um, the revelation, and he's proclaiming something in this verse as well. And this thing he's proclaiming, and we're going to see in this passage of Scripture, is can be very offensive. Let's look at verse 23. It says, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. So preaching Christ crucified can be very offensive. I've actually had somebody say, you're offending me. You are offending me. I said, well, it's an offensive thing to say. I know. And what the, why, why is it offensive? I'm going to tell you that pre preaching a Christ crucified makes religious people angry. And it makes the lost people laugh at our message and scorn us to shame. Now listen to me, when, we, when we're preaching this Christ crucified, it's offensive because all men have a God. Every man has a God. And before you can get a man to follow the one true God of the Bible, you're going to have to kill his God. And that's not very easy. They don't like that. They're going to fight against it. It can be tough. But until they can kill that old God and then them themselves die, they can't come to the knowledge of the truth. Right. And it's the preaching of Christ crucified that's going to bring that death. Yes, Men like their gods. Their little G gods. They like their sin. Now, we don't always have a bunch of people. We tend to think, well, there's a bunch of people out there. They're just begging for us to come and tell them about Jesus. They're not. They're living in inequity, and they like it. They're sinners, and they like it. And when we go and tell them that what they are, they're offended by that. But just like Paul says, I'm not ashamed of that. The gospel is an offensive message. And it's offensive because you're telling somebody that they're a sinner and they've offended a holy God. They don't want to hear that. But I'm telling you, when, it, when you embrace it, that's when it becomes the power of God. Man is a sinner. You've got to keep that in mind. And then we, always, we see in verse 18 that it's a decisive announcement. That it always comes with a decision. Whenever we're confronted with the preaching of Christ crucified, you're going to have to make a decision. There's two things there. It says, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Which, which way do you want to be going? Which way are you on? One man knows the truth, and he must decide to take heed to it. Right? And the, um, when we believe we must choose whether or not to be obedient to it. As a Christian, when we read the book, and I, I know that I've experienced where I read that, and I go, whoa. Or I've been under preaching and says, well, that thing in my life needs to go. Now it's up to me to either to get rid of it or to continue on in it. Or when God tells us through his word, we need to be doing something else. Are we going to do it or are we not as Christians? The choice is ours. And we must take heed to the truth and to follow what God says and not what we think we ought to. Right. There are two paths here. Like the nation Israel, and we can read about in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 30, 19 says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, Choose life, and both thou and thy seed may live. We have a disobedient nation who's turned against God. God's given them everything, and they've completely turned against it. They've turned to their own gods, their own way. And God at this point is saying, you need to turn from your ways. You need to turn from your false gods, your idols, and you need to turn to me, the true God. And he says, I've set before you these things. Therefore, choose life. He's even telling, here's your choices. Here's what I'm telling you as God, all-knowing God and mighty God, is what to choose. 
and they chose to reject him. But listen to me, when, when, we're, when we're dealing with people, man knows that there is a God, right? Man knows that. It's obvious. You can't look around and think that there's no God. You would have to be insane. But with man knowing there's a God, they're choosing to reject that God. And how we know that is because they're men and they're rebels. They're not animals. They're not dogs or cats. They know there's a God and they're rejecting God. And why would somebody reject God? It's because he doesn't want to be accountable. Because if you embrace that there's a God, that means that you're created. And if you're created, then that means you're going to have to be accountable to your creator. And who wants to do that? I was in a museum, a creation museum, and they had a whole a sign, this whole kiosk thing full of quotes from really smart scientists who are basically saying the same thing. It goes along the lines of, if there's no way that evolution is possible, but the only other option is God, and I certainly am not going to believe in God, so I have to go with evolution. In their own words, and in phrased in about 100 different ways, they're saying the same thing. Basically, that I'm going to reject God because I'm a rebel, and I know if I embrace God, I'm going to have to be accountable to that God, and I'm going to have to change my life. And they don't want to do it. But we do have here a redemptive message. Again, let's look at verse 24. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. The message of the cross is where we find redemption. Amen. And so you can paint a pretty bleak picture on whether or not we should even go talk to people because they want to reject it. They love their sin, on and on and on. But listen to me, the power of the cross can enter into a man. And he can be saved. Amen? Amen? That's, we're all here today saved, right? Amen. And if we're not, and if you're not saved in here, then I'm telling you that you could call in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. This is a very redemptive message. This, we, we actually have no salvation without the cross. There's no salvation apart from it. That it was 100% necessary, and the work on the cross was complete. And so this is where we draw much hope. We don't go and try to reach people because of what they're doing or not doing or that we feel bad for them. We go there because God's told us to go there because he died on a cross for them. And we go there and tell them to bring God glory. Amen. And we've all been included in that redemption. When you hear the voice of God, it says here in... Uh, Verse 24, but unto them which are called. Those are the ones that have heard God's voice. They've heard the voice of God. Those of you who have been called and you're in Christ today, you've heard that voice and you've made that choice to follow after Him. You read this book and you, and you, you see it for what it is. It comes off the page that you don't hear. It's not the preacher's voice, but it's God's voice. God speaks to you through the preacher. God speaks to you through His Word, and that's God's voice. When you fall under conviction, that's the work of the Spirit of God. Amen. And that's where we're uh, striving to go today, is be controlled by that. And in order to have salvation, you must hear that. The voice of God. The power, the wisdom of God. Not man's knowledge. I can't convince you anything. <laughs> I could sure try, but it's not going to help. You need to hear from God. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Ephesians 1.7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of of His grace. It's Almighty God's riches that brings us redemption and salvation. That's right. And it's our story. It's, it's where God's brought us, how He's brought us out of uh, death into life. It's how He's taken a, a poor, wretched sinner like us and turned him into a child of God. That's the redemption work of the cross. That's the message of the cross. 
It could be eternal damnation on one side if you continue to reject God. But boy, if you, if you follow God and realize who you are as a sinner, and you can admit that, admit your faults, and you could confess them to God and turn to Christ for salvation, it can look a lot different from, for you. And I always think about Paul when I think about this concept. It really hit him. Once a persecuting the church and moves on into reaching Asia Minor for the gospel. And in verse 18, we see that there's an invitation as well of God to man. God is inviting us to do something. And we see that God takes a lot of pleasure in doing so. In verse 21, it says, For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. Here it is, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. It pleases God. Now to think of God being pleased makes me smile. It pleases God to use foolish preaching to save the sinners who believe. That's how he's chosen to do it. He's taken delight in it. He loves it. He's pleased with it. To reach those who believe for the, the foolish preaching of the word. The wisdom of the world does not please God. When we take our tradition and we take the things that we like to do and we try to put them on other people, that is not pleasing to God. What pleases God is the, the preaching of the cross, of Christ and Him crucified. So what's it, what's it mean to please God in Hebrews eleven six, 6? It says, without faith... It is impossible to please Him. Right. So that means that when we have faith, what are we doing? Pleasing God. Pleasing God. The world by wisdom, no, not God. The miracle of salvation from being death into life, like I was talking about the, before, the, the gospel should be as to ourselves as it is pleasing to God to save us. Every day when we wake up in the morning, I think that part of our way we need to get going is to realize that we're a child of God. We're a child of Almighty God, that we've been, uh, we're fellow heirs with Christ, and, it, and we can think of what it took as the cross, that we have a, a Savior who is willing to come into this world and take our place. We have that. We have a Savior. And there's a purpose behind all that in verse 18. God's purpose is to save us. He's not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. That's his purpose. He saves us from our sin. He's saving us from ourselves. That we don't have to be a slave and in bondage to sin, that we can be serving a risen Savior with our life. We have that ability through repentance and faith. Now, if we're going to come to God, it's going to have to be through Jesus Christ. And it's going to have to be on his, his terms through repentance and faith. We do not come on our own terms. Right. We, we don't make deals with God. God has set out what we need to do before us, and we need to do what he says to do. Amen. Amen. Repentance and faith. Listen to me. The cross of Christ was not in vain. Amen? Amen. we got to remember as Christians that Jesus isn't some sort of convenience for our life. Jesus is not a convenience. He's an absolute necessity. If we want life at all, it's going to be in Jesus Christ, and that's it. We don't have some life of our own, and we're going to somehow add Jesus to it to make it better. That's not what's happening in the Bible. That's not what God's words teaches. That's not what the cross teaches. It teaches that Jesus becomes the Lord of our life. Every part of it. We don't keep part of it, and He do the rest of it, and then we are going to do things our way. In some ways, we can't do that. It's like we see, we see Peter fall to his knees and says, or Thomas, when he touches the scars of his resurrected body, and he falls and says, my Lord and my God. That is the last time when you say, my Lord and my God, you can count anything as yours, because Jesus Christ is Lord of your life. And we must live like that. And it's because of the preaching of the cross, the message of the cross, that that's possible. That He came in. We're not our own. He bought us with a price. 
the precious shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, hanging on a cross. We're not our own. We don't live our own life. We live for Jesus Christ. It's a necessity. It's a must-have, the complete. It's not just to make our life better, although it does. Amen? And then we're going to see the process of this. In verse 21, it says, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And then down to verse 24 again, it says, But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. This all comes from the word of the cross, the message of the cross, the preaching of the cross is how this is possible. There's no Jew, there's no Greek. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew and you're a, you're a, a child of Abraham, it doesn't matter. You need Christ. If you're a Greek, if whatever it is, if you're Chinese, you're American, it does not matter. Your nationality, you need Jesus Christ. There's no difference. We all need Christ. Flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom of God. And this comes from the word of the cross, the message of the cross. To all people, it's all inclusive. It includes everybody. So do we believe that today and, and that this message, and do we have the salvation that this message preaches? That's what this, this whole book is centered around that. A resurrected Savior. Amen. Right? I, I, I serve a living God. And people say, well, Jesus Christ is dead. No, He's not. <laughs> he is alive and well. Amen? Amen? And people will follow after these other men, and, and they'll say, well, I follow this guy. And you say, well, where's that guy at today? Well, he's dead. Well, what good is that? If I'm going to follow a dead guy, just as well follow myself, because I'm going to die. We follow a risen, a risen Savior, a risen Lord. Amen. The right hand of God. God is 100% man and 100% God is exactly what we needed. Because we needed a man to live perfectly in our place. And we needed a God in order to do it. And we have that both in Jesus Christ. You think of God taking on flesh in the tabernacle of a human body. For us. That should make you jump for joy. So basically, all of this, this message of the cross, this idea of the foolishness of preaching, comes down to this. If a man believes that he hears the voice of God, and I'm telling you, man will hear it. And that's why we plant seeds. That's why we go down. That's why you're going down to the thing. We, we try to reach people, even if they spit in your face or even if they punch you in the face. They slam the door. Or they call you a fool. It doesn't matter because we're doing it for God and we're planting seeds. And you'll never know the ones that are open to it and the ones that will call on the name of the Lord. And they will be saved. Again, we just think of what God's done for us. Why do you know Jesus Christ? It's probably because somebody told you. And it's you heard the voice of God through them. And there was no other choice for you than to repent. That was the only action we could do is repent and turn and turn unto the Lord Jesus Christ and call on the name of the Lord and be saved. So it comes down to two different things, and this is one, it's very simple, is either we hear the voice of God and we're saved, or it becomes the power of God, because we're saved, and we can sit there and uh, read over and over and over, and we can hear the gospel over and over and over, and every time I hear that somebody was saved, it hits my heart, and for some reason my eyes leak. And I have a thing where it's, I, I just can't hold it together. Someone else believes. That, that somebody's called on the name of the Lord and they've been saved. And I hear that gospel message over and over and over, and it makes me smile more and more and more because I realize what God's chosen to do in my life. Or you can perish. 
to them that perish, it's foolishness. You reject God, and you can perish. You can be separated eternally from God in a place called hell. And if somebody's going to really pull for that, and they're going to push for that, all we can do is tell them the truth. We can't save souls. But we can tell them. We can warn them. But as for you and I, as followers of Christ in this room, it's the power of God. Just think about that. Jesus Christ coming and taking on flesh from heaven, leaving everything behind to come for you. To live your life for you, in your place. And not only save you, but He's going to give you life. And He's going to give you an abundant life of freedom. He's going to give you blessings beyond compared to anything else. And so let's take this message of the gospel as we leave here today and let's live that out ourselves is live as though we're children of God. And we could reach a dying world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you that we have uh, this body of believers here gathered today. I just pray, God, that you be glorified as we consider the gospel message today by the glories of your riches Lord we can be saved can we not be ashamed of the gospel because it is the very power of God <clears throat> and help us to realize that we have that same power within us God if we could just rid ourselves of ourselves and serve you our risen Lord now, God, we need your help doing it. We certainly can't muster up power, and any that we can certainly doesn't compare to yours. And so we invite you into our lives, Lord, and just ask that you work and that we could recognize you for who you are and that we can surrender. We see ourselves as rebels in need of laying up our arms and being able to embrace you, a holy God. Now help us to do this as we go today, Lord. Thank you for us being able to be in your house today, unhindered and unmolested, Lord, that we could just stand firm on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ and on your word. God, help us to do just that. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. And we are dismissed. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs>